welcome back to our course on the Quran and its relation to the Bible. This is a special session because we are being filmed so that we can make a connection with my MOOC course, which is going on currently across the globe, which is entitled simply Introduction to the Quran. But the two courses now are intersecting because our course here at Notre Dame is now in the section of Themes of the Quran, and our last class session within that section is dedicated to God in the Quran. And for the MOOC, we're now in week three, which is dedicated entirely to the question of God in the Quran. So we read for a Notre Dame class three different Quranic surahs, 17, 36, and 37, which have various expositions and reflections on the nature of God and God's relationship to humanity. We read different surahs for the MOOC class. And so what I'm going to do today is give a general presentation about the relationship of God and humanity that I think applies to both what's going on in the Notre Dame class and the MOOC class. And of course, all of this anticipates our Friday session, which many of you have signed up for. And I'll remind you about it, Notre Dame students, on Thursday, our Friday Zoom session, where we'll be meeting um, some of the students in the MOOC class from across, uh, across the globe. So um, even though this presentation is going out around the globe through the MOOC session, um, the idea is to sort of show what the ambiance of a Notre Dame class is, so please don't hesitate to speak as usual. Interrupt me if you have questions or comments along the way. I'm going to work with a PowerPoint, basically, which is going to address the theme of God, but specifically the question of divine mercy and divine anger or vengeance, and even the question of divine scheming, scheming or plotting. And we're going to focus particularly on the Quran, but there's a few spots where we're going to note parallels with the Bible. Is that okay as a plan? So please don't hesitate to stop me as I go along, and I'm going to leave time at the end for questions and comments. And also, Notre Dame students shouldn't hesitate to bring up specific questions that came from the surahs that we read. Um, that's fine as well. There's a lot of material there. Surah 37, for example, has a series of biblical prophets in which we see something like punishment stories. Maybe you want to speak about that, or other elements. We have a parable, an interesting parable in Surah 36 about three men. Um, and we could speak about that as well, one of whom is martyred and is given a heavenly reward. Okay, but let's enter into this theme of divine mercy, vengeance, and scheming in the Quran. Um, I think the first um, bit that I'd like to begin with is just coming up with something like a typology of divine mercy in the Quran. So what, is it, what does it mean to be merciful, at least in the Quran's idea? And we might think of, well, mercy, mercy um, consists principally of forgiveness, um, in interpersonal relationships we usually think that way, like you've done something wrong, you've harmed someone, and they forgive you, they let it go. Um, but the Quran has a more multifaceted notion of what divine mercy is. And the big challenge for this lecture is trying to think about how that notion of mercy can coexist with the Quran's notion of divine vengeance or divine judgment. So let's begin with three types of divine mercy in the Quran. And the first is, the Qur'an, according to the Qur'anic idea, is that your creation itself is an expression or a manifestation of divine mercy. Qur'an here in Surah 16, or Surah the Nahl, the chapter of the bees, um, declares, God has brought you forth from the bellies of your mothers while you did not know anything. He made for you hearing, eyesight, and hearts so that you may give thanks. It may seem like a very simple sort of declaration of these are the, the senses that humans have, but there's something more to it here, isn't there? There's this notion that God has given you a certain capability not only to hear and to see, but to reflect, right? It's giving you hearing, eyesight, and hearts. And the notion of hearts here, it seems to be in the Quran, the notion of hearts is not only an organ of emotion or a symbolic expression of the center of emotion, but the the center also of cognition, of thinking. So God has given you eyes to see, to take in information, ears to hear, to take in information, and then hearts or a center of cognition to reflect on that information. And in a sense, although it's a bit hard to conceive of this when you're thinking of the human, uh, the, human um, the notion is, he, you, you could have been created without these things, but you have them, which is merciful because it allows you to recognize God as Lord and therefore to save yourself. There are other expressions in the Quran of mercy in creation, which 
connect more to nature, and we've seen some of those both in our Notre Dame course and in our MOOC, in various passages where the Quran speaks of rain, or the mountains, or even the way in which boats float upon the sea as expressions of divine mercy. Why are they divine mercy? Because humans are, are able to reflect on them and come to the conclusion that there must be a creator. Right, so we're speaking about um, something like a natural or a rational theology. So even independent of, uh, of divine revelation, that God has given you organs of sense and created things in the natural world which are images or reflections of the divine, that should be enough to allow you to come to the conviction that there is a God, there is a creator. So that's the first type of divine mercy. Any questions or comments about this? Okay, well, the second type is revelation. And this might be a bit clearer, but, I mean, it's just important to, to understand that in the Quran's vision of the relationship between God and humanity, God didn't need to speak. God wasn't obliged to speak, but he chose to speak. In other words, we could think of it, God could have created hum humans and said, well, you're on your own now. Um, you have these organs of sense. You have this center of cognition, your hearts. Um, you can look at the natural world and observe things and come to the conclusion that there is a God. He could have sort of like stopped there, but he didn't. He chose to speak to humanity. And the, the verse which I've used to represent this is um, the very um, first revelation according to tradition. You may remember the story. Muhammad was meditating on a mountain outside of Mecca, Mount Hira. And this is where the angel first appeared to him with the words, Iqra bismi rabbaka ladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created man from a clinging mass. The word there is a bit difficult in Arabic. It's alaq. And it could have different um, connotations. Um, but the end of this little passage, these five verses, which are meant to be the first revelation from God to Muhammad, speaks of God teaching man what he did not know. Right, so the traditional sense of revelation is um, in, that in revelation, God could tell you things which you should know, but simply forget because of humanity's natural um, inclination to forget because of, of sin or forget it by itself. Or God could reveal things that you wouldn't know otherwise. And here the Quran seems to be speaking about, um, about the, the, second, the second element. There are things which you can't know just by nature, which God has revealed to you. I remember I was once giving a lecture in England at the University of Oxford, and I made a point about um, the punishment stories, which all of you know, I think, in the MOOC and in the Notre Dame class, that, you know, we have all these stories of divine punishment. This is a big theme in the Quran. The people of Hud, the people of Noah, the people of Saleh, the people of Lot, the people of Shreve. All these people were destroyed, you know, one after another. And I made the point in this lecture that, um, you know, the Quran seems to focus on divine judgment or divine vengeance in these stories. And a Muslim imam who was the chaplain, the Muslim chaplain at the University of Oxford, he stood up and he said, you know, but God has sent 124,000 prophets. That's not in the Quran, that's Islamic tradition. But he said, they sent all, he sent all these prophets time and time again. So it was only after, you know, all of this ministry of the prophets that God decided to destroy um, different cities out of punishment for their unbelief. There is a verse in the Quran in 1715, something we read for Notre Dame, which says, we never punish a people before sending it a warner. So that does seem to be in the notion of the Quran, that, that God warns people by sending them messengers or prophets. And that, that is the second type of mercy. Right? God didn't have to speak, he didn't have to send a prophet, but he did. Also in the Quran's what we call theodicy, that is explanation for the problem of evil, is the notion that God sent a prophet to every, every people, to every ummah, every nation. I was speaking that, about this um, with a student here. Recently, um, I mean, I think it is meant to be a theodicy. It is meant like to express this the idea that God hasn't punished anyone without warning them. So every people group, I mean, in theory, every Native American tribe, every Polynesian nation, Every people group in the world has received some profit, you know, that's the notion. There may be some logical gaps there because 
Did every generation of every people get a prophet? Or is it just one generation? Then what about the people before then? And there's some logical gaps there. But it's clear that there's an effort at a theodicy. There's an effort at thinking through how God could punish people. And, and there's a conviction that he would only punish people who have sent a word. Okay? So that's the second type of mercy. First type of mercy is nature or creation itself. The second is revelation or sending a prophet. And then the third is forgiveness. So the Quran speaks often about forgiveness. Um, we're going to see the Quran does not speak about unconditional forgiveness. And there's going to be a slide coming up in the PowerPoint which will describe this. But here in Surah the nisa chapter 4 of the Quran, we read, we did not send any apostle but to be obeyed, etc., etc. Had they come to you and pleaded to God for forgiveness, and the apostle, that is Muhammad, the prophet, Rasul, that's a translation of the Arabic word Rasul, had pleaded forgiveness for them, they would have surely found God clement and merciful. Of course, we see um, forgiveness is not unconditional. There's a suggestion that you have to ask for it, and like buried in that suggestion is the notion that you have to be a believer in both God and the messenger, right? Because there's this notion that the prophet is interceding in this case for this person. So it's implied, it's not explicit, but it's implied that you need to be a prophet in both God and the messenger. So we have this sense that God forgives those who believe and repent. Whether God forgives those who do not believe or who believe but are sinners and do not repent is a debated question. I don't know if we should go there. Is anyone interested in that question? Does God forgive unbelievers? Does God forgive believing sinners? Okay, so I'm going to assume you have some interest and say... <laughs> um, the notion of God forgiving unbelievers um, is generally rejected among classical Sunni Muslim theologians. But there are certain theologians who insist that ultimately God's mercy will overcome everything. And we'll see some verses which seem to speak about the depth of God's mercy. One uh, Muslim scholar who's known to be sort of a rigorous sort of the founder of modern Sunni Salafism and fundamentalism, namely Ibn Taymiyyah. And it's a bit controversial, but many scholars conclude that he argued that hell will not be eternal. That um, even unbelievers will eventually be brought out of hell. So hell is a place of punishment, but temporary punishment, because God's mercy ultimately will overcome his, his judgment. Um, so that's for unbelievers. But the, the vast majority of scholars do not hold that view. They hold that hell is eternal and that unbelievers are punished. Um, so um, for the question of sinful Muslims, there we have a division between two different classical schools of Sunni theology. Um, there seems to be more leniency in the Ash'ari school for the possibility that sinful Muslims will be only temporarily in hell and then moved into heaven. Um, the Mu'tazili school is more strict in its view of divine justice and um, uh, sees that um, people will be, uh, sinful Muslims will be permanently punished in hell. Um, there are other schools too, especially in early Islam, the Khariji school and the Murja school, the Murja'i school, which take more extreme positions on the question of the sinful Muslim. Um, Connected with the question of the sinful Muslim is whether the Prophet Muhammad can intercede. This verse actually seems to speak to his ability for intercession. That's a very controversial question in Sunni Islam, especially whether the Prophet has the ability to intercede at all. If he intercedes, does that compromise God's soul sovereignty? Um, but then you have elements of the Quran which seem to suggest that he has the ability to intercede, such as this one. Okay. Um, okay, well, why don't we move on and um, speak generally about um, the role of the Qur'an in the unfolding of divine mercy. Um, you know, I just wanted to get this quotation which sort of speaks to the second element of divine mercy, which is this idea that revelation itself is a divine mercy. So from a Muslim point of view, Muhammad's ministry itself 
every element of that ministry was an expression of God's mercy. Why? Because he came as a warner. There'll be another slide about Muhammad as a warner. And all of the stories he told about divine destruction, even about hell, even the gruesome elements of hell, like drinking boiling water or eating from the fruits of trees, which will be like the heads of demons. You know, even the gruesome stuff, that's an act of mercy. Why? What would be merciful about that? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, there's an Arabic term known as tarhib, which is like instilling fear. So, I mean, it's like, I don't know, when I was learning to, to drive, um, we had to see a video of like these car, terrible car crashes. Has anyone had, had to see like in driver's education? You know, it, these terrible car crashes, and it's like painful to watch, but the idea is, this is good for you because you're going to drive more carefully and maybe not drink and drive or maybe avoid texting and driving, whatever it might be. But it's good for you to see this gruesome stuff, right? That's the understanding of the depictions of hell and of divine punishment that undergirds um, the Quran. Right, so here we have a quotation from Fazlur Rahman who we read this week, or we're reading this week in the MOOC, but not in the Notre Dame class. And Rahman says, listen, the Quran, that's what the Quran is ultimately about. It's like... Someone who takes you and like shakes you and wakes you up, right? It's not meant to be sort of a technical elucidation of theological proofs or theological conclusions or observation about the divine. It's a book of signs, ultimately. The word for verse in the Quran, for a Quranic verse, is a sign. So um, the Quran is a book of signs which are meant to remind you above all of your status as servant of God. God is Lord and your servant, right? So you've probably read the quotation by now, but he says, you know, it's not about theological proofs, but it's how to shake man into belief by drawing his attention to certain obvious facts and turning them into reminders of God. Okay, well, I mean, and that just is connected, I've already alluded to this, to the fundamental role of Muhammad, at least if we follow the Meccan Medinan split, at least in the Meccan period. Muhammad is fundamentally a warner. And most of the prophet tales of pre-Muhammadan prophets, of prophets before Muhammad, portray them as warners as well. You know, when Noah showed up and he's like, listen, God's destruction is coming unless you repent and believe. He wasn't, nothing he did, like, okay, I mean, he built the ark, that mattered. <laughs> so maybe something did matter. But in the logic of the story, it's really what he says that mattered. He came with a warning to save people, right, in the Quran. Same thing with Hud, same thing with Salah, same thing with the other prophets, same thing with Muhammad, at least in the Meccan period. He came to warn people to save them. Right, and the, the Arabic word is nadir, which means warner, and it shows up, I guess, 44 times entirely in the Quranic um, book. Um, you know, we have sent you with the truth to give glad tidings and to war. Um, even this Quranic uh, verse from a Meccan surah at the end, the third quotation there from surah 7 or Al-Araf, Muhammad is only a plain admonisher or warner, nazir. Okay. Now this may change in the Medinan period. I mean, if we follow this, and as all of you know, I think in the MOOC and the Notre Dame class, I have some skepticism about the Meccan Medinan split, but if we follow this traditional split, then the Medinan, Medinan verses, a, a new element of Muhammad's prophetic vocation seems to uh, appear, which is um, Muhammad as ruler, right? He's no longer just warner, he's warner and ruler, and he's the instrument of God. He's carrying out, in his military campaigns, he's carrying out the, the divine judgment against the pagans and the unbelievers. He's also a lawgiver. I mean, he's a ruler, not only in military terms, but also in social or civil terms as well. Okay? So, um, I mean, we're just following through with this notion of warning, sort of developing, right, that second type of mercy, which is revelation as a mercy. Following through with this um, notion of warning, um, it just says something about these earlier prophetic tales that we've heard about, both in the Notre Dame class and the MOOC, we've spoken about a bit. 
namely that these stories of earlier prophets, the point is not to um, un unfold a larger salvation history and to see how, for example, through a series of covenants, history points towards Muhammad. Right? Muhammad doesn't appear as a fulfillment of salvation history. He just appears as a new warner in the cycle of human history between admonishment and humans forgetting, and new admonishment and hum humans forgetting again. And then Muhammad comes as the last of the admonishers. Right? It's not as, we don't see what I would say is a coherent salvation history which takes us from Adam up to Muhammad. We have a cyclical history, a cycle of, of warning and forgetting. Right, so we see this in these two quotations. I mean, look at how in Quran chapter 7, first, we have Hud, the prophet Hud, who calls his people to remember the experience of the people of Noah. He says, Don't you, did you hear the story about Noah? This is Hud speaking, right? When did he speak? Where did he speak exactly? The Quran never tells us. Sometime before Muhammad, he spoke to some people named Ad, right? So, uh, but he told them, remember the people of Noah who were before me and what happened to them. Remember that flood thing, you know? Um, and the same thing with the prophet who comes after him, who's Saleh, a few verses later, Saleh points now not to the people of Noah, but the people of Hud, to the Ahad. And he's like, remember the Ahad, they were destroyed. So Hud's like, remember the people of Noah, they were destroyed. And Saleh's like, remember the people of Hud, they were destroyed. Aren't you going to make a better choice? And do they make a better choice? No, right. They don't. Okay. But it's just to put in context what's happening then in the Quran itself. You see how the, the logic unfolds? The Quran itself, it's like Hud speaking about Noah or Saleh speaking about Hud. Muhammad is now, or from a theological point of view, a Muslim theological point of view, God is speaking about Hud and Saleh and the other prophets. Yeah. Check. So when it's said in the Quran that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. You're kind of intending that, or interpreting that as like it's it's really just in terms of, uh, in terms of succession, he is the last, but not in any way like a culmination or any sort of theological, I don't know, qualitative difference. It's it's merely just that he's the final one. Is that what's kind yeah, of? Yeah, that's tough. Be it's a great question because then we have to discern between the construction of Islamic doctrine and Islamic doctrine is develops from both the Qur'an and the Hadith and rational reflection and leads to the articulation of a teaching about Muhammad according to which uh, Muhammad um, is distinguished from all other prophets. He's not simply the last one. He's the only prophet who's sent to the entire world and he's the only prophet whose teaching will never be abrogated. Right, so that, but that's constructed through Islamic teaching. It has, there's evidence, there's proof text taken from the Qur'an and the Hadith you know, to defend that. It's a very good question. But we do have the famous verse, Qur'an 33, verse 40, which speaks about Muhammad as, as seal of the prophets. Um, um, some people hold that, what does it mean to be a seal? Well, one thing you can do with, the word is khatam in Arabic. One thing you can do with a seal or khatam is you can close something, but you can also prove something or validate something with a seal. Right? Both are possible interpretations. And when you compare the cognate Hebrew term, which appears, for example, in the book of Daniel in the Bible, um, the seal is something that's, that's closed. It means to, it's used to close a scroll. Um, so some people suggest that it's meant to imply, therefore, somehow like the completion of something. But even then, in the book of Revelation, then those scrolls are, the, the seals are opened. Um, and there are, there is new prophecy in the book of Revelation that takes place. So anyway, people fight about what is meant by seal. The whole thing is complicated even further with the Islamic doctrine that Jesus will return in the end times, which means that technically Muhammad is not the last prophet, it's actually Jesus. So that's, and then there are answers from a Muslim perspective about why that doesn't really matter because Jesus is meant to follow the Sharia or the law of Muhammad. So Muhammad is still the last lawgiver. 
So uh, I've probably confused things more than clarified things, but it's a good question. Good question, bad answer. All right, nevertheless, we'll move on. So um, I, I, just to explain this little Latin phrase, ubi sunt, um, um, that's an abbreviation of ubi sunt qui ante nos fuerunt, which means where are those who have gone before us, um, which is like code language for saying we should look at the past and draw lessons from it. Right? And that's what's going on in the Quran, basically. Look at the past and draw lessons from it. Okay? Um, you know, just to, to develop then a little bit, um, the third type of mercy, which is forgiveness, um, and I've already alluded to or suggested that there is not unconditional for forgiveness. And I just want to comment on two different verses here, which are sometimes cited to suggest that the God of the Qur'an is unconditionally merciful. And one of the reasons, I mean, the, and mercy is very important to the Qur'an, right? And I, that could be a reason why people incline towards a teaching that the God of the Qur'an is unconditionally merciful. You know, um, every surah but one, surah nine, Every surah but one begins with the invocation known as the Bismillah. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, the merciful, the benevolent. Actually, Rahman and Rahim are cognates to each other. They both have to do with mercy. Rahman, mercy. Yeah. So we hear it all the time. Oh, and guess what? There's, um, uh, there are certain passages in the Quran which simply call God a Rahman. It's a name for God. Even we read at the end, Notre Dame students read at the end of Surah 17, a verse which says, right at the very end of the chapter, a verse which says, call on God either as Allah or as a Rahman. You know, both are, both are fun. You can speak, speak about Him in either way. Yeah. And Rahman means the merciful. So we have the, God is actually called the merciful. Okay, now, um, counter-argument. Um, so, First thing to note is, if God is called the merciful, that's not an innovation of the Qur'an. Already in southern Arabia, in Yemen, before Islam, a version of that phrase, Ar-Rahman, but it's in a different language, it's ancient South Arabian. So the, the phrase is Rahmanan, with an extra N at the end there, Rahmanan, is, is used for God both by Jews and by Christians. So in Jewish inscriptions and Christian inscriptions, a form of the name, the merciful, is used by God. So it, it could be, what the Quran is actually doing at the end of Surah 17, could be saying, oh, I know, like, some people in this area of the world speak of God as Ar-Rahman. The Quran could be saying, that's fine. That's an okay way to speak about God. Instead of really emphasizing that God is this merciful quality. Now, on the other hand, we've already noted the, the Quran speaks about uh, divine mercy a lot, and it not only describes God as Rahim and Rahman, merciful and benevolent, but it uses other terms. God is called Ghafur, which means forgiving. God is called Ra'uf, which means kind. God is called Tawwab, which means oft turning, turning back towards humans, right? So, and then you have these phrases like this one here in sort of six. To whom belongs whatever there is in the heavens and the earth, say to God, He has made mercy binding for Himself. Right, so, so this statement is often quoted as uh, like a proof that the God of the Quran is unconditionally merciful. He, he has determined, you know, there's a hadith, this is not in the Quran, but there's a hadith which says, um, uh, God wrote on the divine throne itself, that my mercy has preceded, sabaqat is the Arabic, has preceded my wrath. So mercy comes first, then wrath. So this is very important for Islamic theological thinking. Nevertheless, having said that, if we read the whole verse and we see that phrase in context, we can see that mercy is tied up with judgment. It just is. Like, look at the end of the verse. Immediately after mention that mercy is binding, it says, He will surely gather you on the day of resurrection, in, in which there is no doubt, those who have ruined their souls will not have faith. So there's, a, there's an ominous threat there 
maybe not stated really explicitly, but it's there, you know, those who have ruined their souls. Right? So God is not, we're speaking about the third type of mercy, right? God is not unconditionally merciful if that means having mercy also on unbelievers. Right? Mercy is for the believers. It's also for unbelievers who become believers, who repent and believe, they'll have mercy. And it's for believers who are sinners, they'll have mercy. I mean, whether grave sinners will have mercy is another question. But most of them will. Right? But it doesn't seem to be for unbelievers. The second point is from Surah 7, somewhat similar. This is often um, the very Rahmati um, wasa'at kulla shay. My mercy has embraced all things. The end of sort of this quotation in Surah 7, this passage in Surah 7. But if you look at the beginning of this passage, it says, I visit my punishment on whomever I wish. I think it's, Adabi usibu bihi men asham. And if I'm not mistaken, we didn't read Notre Dame students, Fazlur Rahman, but we did in the MOOC, Fazlur Rahman, whose quotation we just said. When he quotes, He's been a little tricky. I mean, trick, trickiness is part of this presentation, right? So he's being a little bit tricky when he quotes this because I believe he only quotes the second part of the verse. He just leaves the first part out. So this third type of mercy, if that means forgiveness, um, it's not unconditional, right? God's mercy is tied up with his judgment. We see this especially in that second quotation there, right? Because there's the affirmation of God's will to punish whomever he wishes. And then there's the, the reference to um, his, um, his mercy embracing all things. Okay? So let's try to figure this out a little bit, right? We have, I guess, like attention, which is mercy and judgment. We see that they're wrapped up together, so let's try to like untangle them. Okay? Let me stop though for questions or comments. Okay, so... Um, I mean, this is just to sort of affirm the point that I was sort of making in the previous slide, that um, mercy in the sense of forgiveness, that third type, is not for everyone. And the Quran, even in Surah 9, thought to be one of the very last surahs revealed, um, it seems to suggest, well, let's just read the quotation. Whether you, and now that use in italics because... It's a little hint to tell you that that second person singular. So whether you, Muhammad, whether you plead forgiveness for them or do not plead forgiveness for them, even if you plead forgiveness for them 70 times, God shall never forgive them. Who's the them? It's the unbelievers. And we can see it in context. It's unbelievers. Because they have defied God and his apostle. Again, apostle is messenger, is Rasul. <laughs> Interesting verse, especially because of the 70, does it make you think of anything? Forgiveness and 70, Eric? Yeah, how, how often should I forgive my brother seven times? No, I tell you 70 times, seven times. I think that's right, is that right? So we find that in the Gospels. Um, here the Quran seems to be playing on this theme of forgiveness and 70 times, but instead of the question being, how often should one person forgive another person, the question is, if you ask God, if you intercede with God 70 times, will that be enough to win the forgiveness of someone else? So it's not one person to another, it's will, if you ask God for forgiveness, for someone else, would that happen? And even 70 times, which presumably, just as in the Gospels, is a symbolic number, um, the point is, you can keep on asking as long as you want, and they will not be forgiven. I mean, another way of just explaining this, going back to the very beginning, with the notion of the three types of mercy, is that the first two types of mercy are for everyone. Right? We don't want to like make it seem like the God of Quran is not merciful. We just want to be like clear and accurate as much as possible. Right? So the notion, like creation is for everyone. God's, the unfolding of divine mercy in creation is for everyone. Everyone has ears. Everyone has hearts. Everyone has eyes. Nature is there for everyone to see. 
I mean almost everyone. Uh, so that's for everyone. And revelation, the second type of mercy, that's for everyone, at least in theory, because the Quran says every nation gets a messenger. But forgiveness is not for everyone. Forgiveness is not unconditional. Sean? Um, quick question on the first type of mercy. Would, you, yeah. would they say that um, their God has less mercy on people who don't have hearing or eyesight? Or is... Yeah, that's, that is a bit of a problem, right? Because... You know, I say, you mean there are blind people, there are deaf people, or Yeah, I mean, you know, Muslim theologians work this out um, in a way that like, God's, God's compassion in that respect is definitely present equally for a blind person or a deaf person. Um, but, like, the... Uh, uh, I see how you just observing that passage by itself, it suggests that, like, you're missing something, right? If you don't have eyesight, you're missing something. You're not able to observe the world. If you don't have hearing, maybe you couldn't hear the prophet. What if you're blind and deaf? So, yeah, I think there's a logical issue there. Um, but certainly Muslim theologians thinking through this would say that God is just as compassionate with them. Um, and they just have the challenge of learning about divine revelation in another way. Okay, so... Um, I mean, that's just to um, speak a little bit about um, that, that third type of mercy. And we're going to try to unpack now a little bit the relationship between judgment and vengeance in particular. Right? If we always saw, already saw that forgiveness is not for everyone, um, we're going to go a little bit further now and say that not only does God withhold his forgiveness, but we're going to see some signs that God actively seeks out and punishes the unbeliever. Okay? That the God of the Quran, does that make sense? Like God is the God of the Quran is just is not just like I won't forgive you, right? But actually like seeks out as though the unbelievers were an adversary. And we even see that in some of the discourses surrounding prophets in the Quran. Um, in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 18, we have the story in the Bible of how um, of how Abraham um, confronts God and basically barters, bargains with God over the city of Sodom where Lot is. And remember he starts with, he says, if there are 50 righteous people in this city, will you still destroy it? And God says no. And, and then he starts the bartering. And he's like, well, what about 45? What about there's just only five missing? Like, that's not a big deal. What if there are 45? Is that enough? You know? And he works them all the way down to maybe 10. I can't remember. Is it 10? And, of course, God still destroys the city. So we learn there actually there weren't that many righteous people at all. So the punishment still takes place, right? Things like this. Now, in the Quran, there's an allusion to Abraham bargaining with God. We don't have the full account. Again, this is one of those places where the Quran depends on its audience's biblical knowledge. Presumably not the written Bible because it wasn't available in Arabic, but of biblical traditions. Right? So the Quran doesn't give the full story, but it speaks of Abraham um, confronting God. But instead of God sort of hearing Abraham out and going back and forth, the Quran seems to reprimand Abraham. Right? We read, O oh Abraham, let this matter alone. Your Lord's edict has already come, and an irrevocable punishment shall overtake you. Right, so he's reprimanded there. So that's one prophet story in which we see the limits of um, the intercession for, of a prophet for unbelievers. Um, I just want to point out two more things that sort of accentuate or highlight the notion of divine vengeance in the Quran. They both have to do with Noah. The first is what God says to Noah after the flood. So in Genesis 9, I mean the punishment still takes place, right? Let's not try to make too big of a difference here, right? Like God destroys all living things except for everything that's in the ark, in the Bible and the Quran. Right? So, uh, but in Genesis 9, afterwards, God is like, okay, we're going to start again. Let's retry this. And you know how this works, right? And so God is like, um, I'm going to give you a couple of rules to follow. You know, you can eat animals now, but don't eat the blood and don't kill each other. Don't kill humans. You can eat, kill animals, but don't kill humans. And I'm going to make a covenant with you and your offspring and actually makes a covenant with the animals as well. The animals were probably like, can we make part of this covenant like not actually killing and eating us? But... That's not mentioned there. 
Um, right? So he makes a covenant with the offspring of Noah and with the animals. And then he says, listen, I'm not going to destroy the earth anymore. And there's a sign. What's the sign about that? The rainbow. Good. So there's a rainbow. So that's the sign, right? The conversation after the flood is different in the Quran. So we read in Surah Hund, Surah 11, it was said, Noah disembark in peace from us with our blessings upon you and upon nations to descend from those who are with you and nations whom we shall provide for. Then a painful punishment from us shall befall them. So there's an allusion actually to punishment. Um, not to the absence of punishment, but to punishment. And even more intriguing, I mean, here is Noah who is speaking, but um, here we see Noah himself praying for the destruction of the faithless. Right? This is in a sort of known as the sort of Noah, 71. Do not leave on the earth any inhabitant from among the faithless. Now, we, the Noah of the, of the Bible in Genesis might have been thinking the same thing. He just doesn't say anything in Genesis till he gets out of the ark. Um, but here we have them praying for... Uh, the destruction of the faithless. He says, if you leave them, they will lead astray your servants and will beget none except vicious ingrates. Okay, so, um, I mean, this is just continuing with the theme of divine vengeance um, and this notion that God not only does not forgive, but he actually actively opposes um, and he opposes both hypocrites and unbelievers. These seem to be two different categories in the Quran. We have a term for hypocrites who are munafiqun, and unbelievers are kufar, right? So um, the hypocrites here, they have forgotten God, so God has forgotten them. And then with the unbelievers, we have this notion of um, divine threat, like God, this, we're sort of getting towards the, towards the scheming part of the lecture, remember that was promised? So we, we have this beginning of this notion, you know, God is like, we're waiting. Or you're waiting to oppose us, we're waiting to oppose you. And then there's this other reference in sort of 89, your Lord is in ambush. Um, okay, well, um, connected to this notion of God is waiting, or God, the ambush is interesting, right? Like God is hiding and collecting information maybe until the time is right, right? So um, then this, all this is connecting to the notion that nothing escapes God. Right? He keep, tr keeps track of everything. This is a verse in sort of 15, um, which is often quoted, I don't know if Rahman quotes this verse as well, but it's often quoted to speak of like uh, God's um, nearness to humanity in the sense of like um, providential nearness, friendship with humanity. Right, because you have this intriguing phrase at the end, we are near to him that is jugular vein. We are near to him than his jugular vein. But if you look at the first part of the verse, it leads us to question, what kind, now, you can take a verse and develop it in different ways, and you could be creative in interpretation, so I'm not suggesting Muslims can't, and so that's a valid interpretation, right? The providential care, friendship, that's actually fine, right? That's in the realm of Muslim theology, mysticism, spirituality. I'm not saying that's illegitimate at all, so don't misconstrue me about this. But if we're just trying to understand the logic of the Quranic text, which is what we're trying to do, the beginning of the verse says, oh, in what way is God near? God is near because he knows what's, what's going on inside you. And in a special way, the, the word there for soul is a nefs. Nefs. And nefs is a word which implies the sinful soul, or the sinful element of humanity. Right? So it's, it's the nefs, and the whispering of the nefs, that God is aware of. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's not only record keeping, it's like also exhortation towards purity and righteousness, right? Because it's like, watch out, be righteous, be pure. It's, there's exhortation. But it's also about, the exhortation is because God is record keeping, right? God is keeping track of everything, even the things you say to yourself secretly. Um, okay. All right, so, I mean, that's interesting. And then um, we have the same phrase at the end of this quotation from Surah 3, or a similar phrase, God knows indeed what is in the breath. What is in your hearts? So he, God knows everything. 
Okay? Um, now, I mean, this just brings us to this notion of, remember I even used this term of like, unbelievers as an adversary of God. Um, and so we're moving towards like divine vengeance here. Now, the word for vengeance in Arabic is intiqam, intiqam. Um, and we have it a couple of times, this phrase, that God is dhu intiqam. And dhu means possessor of. So pos possessor of vengeance. Yeah. And other places we have the plural, muntaqimun. Um, same root word, muntaqimun. Inna muntaqimun. We indeed are taking vengeance, or we will take vengeance. I, there may be an example of that, but it's used, for example, against Pharaoh. God says of Pharaoh, inna muntaqimun. Like, you're denying Moses, we're going to have vengeance on you. Okay? Now, um, I mean, I was just sort of alluding to the fact that, well, Muslim theologians can develop this notion as they will, and theology is not just about literally reading the text, right? Everyone here knows that, I think. Theology is a creative science, which involves reason, and involves um, evidence and um, uh, witness from outside of revelation, from rational reflection, from observing nature, from observing, observing human character, and um, uh, can even involve um, more texts than just one, right? And in Islam, it involves also the hadith, also the writings of different um, religious authorities. So anyway, did you get that point? Is that clear enough? Like, theologically, you can develop things in different ways. So we have this phrase, which on the face of it, seems to mean quite simply, God is vengeful, or God is a possessor of vengeance, du intiqam. And I just gave these other translations here because, you know, Arbery is the only one who actually translates vengeful. Yusuf Ali, um, Arbery is a non-Muslim translator, by the way, maybe that explains something. But Yusuf Ali, who was a Shiite translator quite early, 1934, um, says, Lord of Retribution. Um, Pikthal, we sort of see another sort of twist on this. He says God is able to requite, and then adds in parentheses the wrong. You see what's going on there? It's there. It's not. It's, it's no longer ven, vengeance at all. It's um, retribution, right? At that point, it's retribution. It's about justice, not about vengeance. Um, Marcel Khan, who, who um, is um, he, his translation is together with a Moroccan. Musan Khan is a Pakistani a Moroccan named Hilali, um, together they translated the text. That's become the official Saudi translation of the Quran in English. Again, all able of retribution. And then Muhammad Asad is like the most creative. He says an inventor of evil. You know, so like as God, I, I, I can't help but think of superheroes, you know, avenger of evil. Isn't that, isn't, aren't there the Avengers? Yeah, okay. So avenger of evil. Um, similar is Hamidullah, who was a Pakistani um, translator into French, and the French phrase also means um, possessor of the ability or the power to punish. Right? Okay, clear enough? So it's just to say that um, this question of vengeance in the text, to Muslim interpreters, um, it, they don't all take it literally. Like, we shouldn't think that that's the Muslim confession of God is a vengeful God, right? Um, theology means the construction of ideas from a variety of sources, not simply a literal meaning of the text. So if the text literally says that God is a possessor of vengeance or God is vengeful, um, Muslim interpreters take that in a number of different directions. Okay, okay. questions or comments? Okay, um, well, I just wanted to make this point that maybe there's actually something good about divine vengeance. Um, which, I mean, it doesn't sound good, right? Like, especially if it's like flood or something. Like, that sounds bad. But maybe there's actually something good, right? Because what does it mean if God is the one who's, who carries out vengeance? It means that humans are not supposed to. You see what I mean there? And this is something we have in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the Romans, you know, and he's quoting something from the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, he says, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. It's a nice expression. Like, make sure God has some space to express his wrath, you know. Leave room for the wrath of God. 
For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You know? So, but there is something positive about that, right? Which is like, you should live in harmony with others. And if there's any vengeance that's going to be taken out, it, that's God's role. It's not your role. And in fact, by taking out vengeance against someone, Paul is implying, right? You're actually um, usurping, is that the right word? The right of God. And there's actually something similar in the Quran, in Surah 5, where you take the lead in all good works, to Allah shall be the return of you all, marja'akum, whereat he will inform you concerning that about which you used to differ. Yunabi'ikum bima kuntum fihi takhtalifun. So, um, there's a little bit of a threat there, right? Like God is going to, he's going to set everything straight. Um, but the point here clearly is, um, it's not your role, just do good works. That's your role. And we don't really have to go there if you don't want to, if you're not interested. But, I mean, these sort of passages suggest that laws which currently exist in some Muslim countries about things like blasphemy and apostasy and insulting the Prophet Muhammad or desecrating the Qur'an, that they're not Qur'an. I mean, we, we could debate about how much this quotation represents the spirit of the Qur'an. I actually think it does represent the spirit of the Qur'an. And by the way, it's coming from a surah that's supposed to be along with Surah 9, one of the very last surahs revealed. So even from that perspective, it would be authoritative. It just suggests that, you know, when you have vigilante groups in places like Pakistan or other countries, not only Pakistan, don't want to single out Pakistan, um, but when there are vigilante groups, um, that um, punish people, accusing them of some sort of blasphemy or apostasy, leaving Islam. It's not your role to take out vengeance. God can do that. He's capable of doing that. You don't have to do it now. Let God take care of things. He's, God says, You're all coming back to me. I will punish as I will. Don't take that right from me. I mean, I'm sort of channeling both Paul and Quran chapter 5. Okay, questions or comments? Okay, well, um, I just want to make the point that vengeance is not only Quranic, but is also biblical. So we're not singling out, you know, the Quran as being, um, like, especially um, focused on the vengeance of God. Right, so here we have an allusion to um, um, divine vengeance in Quran 43. But we also have it um, in the Bible. I just wanted to show that we have this reference here um, to God's um, anger with um, Israel when Israel is disobedient. A fire is kindled by my anger and it burns in the depths of Sheol. I will heap evils upon them. I will spend my arrows upon them. So we have, we have this God, God's anger appears also. By the way, um, divine anger also appears in the Quran. Vengeance seems to follow from divine anger, even in the last verse of Surah 1, Al-Fatiha. In that verse, the believer prays to God, asking for God that he may not be counted among those, among those rather, upon whom God is angry. Al-Maghdubi alayhim. The Arabic word for anger is ghadab. ghadab. Okay, so um, vengeance actually appears in both books. Um, now, um, I want to get into divine um, trickery now as sort of the final step and then we'll, be, we'll have some time for questions or comments and then we'll be done. Um, so, I mean, we sort of suggest, remember we said that, oh, where we're going with all this is not just that God doesn't forgive, but God is sort of actively opposed to the unbelievers. Remember we had that thing about, I am waiting, your Lord is in ambush. <sighs> right, so there's this notion of um, God scheming maybe against the unbelievers, not against the believers. It's not just like, um, you know, playing games with humans, but against those who are opposed to him. Right, so we have an allusion to divine trickery. Now, the most famous verse which seems to speak of divine trickery is Quran chapter 3, verse 54. وَمَكْرُوا وَمَكْرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ مَكْرِينَ and they plotted, and God plotted, and then there's this controversy about how to translate the final phrase, 
God is the best of plumbers. I believe Muhammad Asad translates this by saying God is above all plotters, is better than plotters. So he's not a plotter, right? But I think it's pretty clear if you look at the fullness of divine vocabulary, um, of Quranic vocabulary rather, that um, the Quran speaks of divine trickery or plotting. Not only is mekr um, used, but other words like khada um, are used for divine um, plotting. Aghwa, we're about to see, which seems to mean something like deception also appears in the Qur'an. So there is this sort of constellation of vocabulary around the notion of divine scheming. By the way, this verse is the one that our Notre Dame students have encountered already because it's connected to the crucifixion of Jesus, even though the crucifixion verse is actually in the next surah, it's in surah 4, 157. This verse was often used to explain the whole story of the substitution of someone else for Jesus. Um, and so here we have the phrase from 4157 about the crucifixion. And so the crucifixion, at least according to the standard interpretation, is thought to be a plot. You know, the Jews thought they would defeat and kill the prophet of God. In 4157, they boast about killing him. But actually, they were tricked the whole time because it was someone else that they crucified who God trans transformed to look like Jesus. Now, we're just, lo and behold... We're going to see in a moment that um, the crucifixion, also in early Christian thinking, was connected to an idea of a divine plot or scheme, but a different plot or scheme. So um, um, before we get to that, so just we'll hold that. Um, one particular Islamic theological notion of how God acts through a sort of plot or scheme is known as istidraj. So I just wanted to comment on this. There's not a lot of Quranic evidence for istidraj, but there are a couple of verses which I'll show you, which are usually taken as proof text for the notion. But let me just introduce the notion of istidraj. Istidraj, the notion is that it's like a reverse theodicy. You know this term, you mentioned it earlier in this lecture, right? So what is a theodicy, anyone? Justice of God. Sorry? The justice of God. Yeah, it's connected to the justice of God. What else can we add to the notion of theodicy? Problem of evil. Yep, it's connected to the problem of evil. So it's like an, an argument or response to the problem of evil, an argument which is meant to explain how there could be a good, powerful God and evil in the world. So, um, and you, so usually it's meant to explain, like, why do bad things happen to good people? Like me, for example. Why do these bad things keep happening to me, you know? I won't list them all. Um, I'll do that later, um, after the filming is done. Uh, <laughs> right? So why do bad things happen to good people? You know, all these bad things happen. So um, that's the usual theodicy. Istidraj works with uh, something like a reverse theodicy. It's asking the opposite question, namely, maybe you asked this question too. What's the opposite question? Yeah? Why do good things happen to bad people? Yeah, why do good things happen to bad people, you know? Like, why did... I mean, this will only work for those of you in the MOOC who are American or for some reason like American football, but like, why did Tom Brady win all those Super Bowls, you know? Like, how did that happen, you know? Tom Brady's a quarterback for a famous American football team. Uh, maybe he's actually a good guy. I shouldn't be anti-Tom Brady. But that's just hypothetical, right? He also, you know, we're at the University of Notre Dame, and he was a quarterback at our rival school, the University of Michigan, before becoming a professional football player. So from my perspective, that does make him sort of evil. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Why do, um, why do good things happen to bad people? And the notion of istidraj is that God heaps good things upon bad people, namely, but by bad people here, the notion is unbeliever. Right, the moral and the ethical is tied up with the theological here. So God heaps good things upon the unbeliever to keep him or her in unbelief. Well, that's interesting, right? Because it sort of suggests that the opposite, like some sort of suffering or deprivation, could be a form of grace. We'll get back to that. Deprivation or suffering could be a grace. Why? Because... It reminds you of your dependence upon God. Right? We've had these verses in the Quran where the Quran says, when you're out at sea, 
and, and stuck in a storm and fearful of your life, you call on me. You forget those other gods. But when you come back to land, you, for, you forget me and you go back to those other gods, you know? So it's in distress that you think of God. Yes, Olivia. So is this kind of like a, an indirect form of hardening the hearts of non-believers? Yeah, I think so. That's a good way of putting it. And we're going to have a slide on hardening the hearts or sealing hearts. Yeah, that's, that's very useful. So I mean, we'll just go through these quickly. So Quran chapter 3, verse 178, Let the faithless not suppose that the respite we grant them is good for their souls. We give them respite only that they may increase in sin. Quran 1975, whoever abides in error, the all-beneficent, that's Ar-Rahman, remember we said that's a name for God, it really means the merciful, shall prolong his respite until they sight what they have been promised. So he'll keep you going unaware until the punishment comes. So it's sort of a scheme, right? Um, it's kind of connected to this verse, not totally. This is where Moses is frustrated with all the good things that Pharaoh has. Right? And he's like, stop it, stop doing it. It's like he's saying, stop the istidraj. Kind of, right? Moses says to God, O Lord, you have given Pharaoh and his elite glamour and wealth. And so he says, blot out their wealth and harden their hearts so that they do not believe until they cite the painful punishment. It's a little bit different, but there's, there's still the notion of divine scheming that leads ultimately to punishment in that verse. Okay, um, we are almost done, but... Um, I just want to, there's going to be sort of two more things about the Quran, and then that early thing that I promised, or that thing that I promised about early Christian interpretation <coughs> of the, the, um, the crucifixion. So, I mean, I mentioned that there's this constellation of vocabulary around deception. We had the word mekir before, and I mentioned this word aghwa, which also means something like to deceive. Um, the interesting thing about it is, um, aghwa is used both for God and for the devil, right? So here we have, um, we have the devil saying to God, O oh Lord, because you have led me astray. Now, are you, should you believe the devil? That's, a, we'll have to we'll dedicate a whole other class uh, on that. Isn't there a line in Shakespeare where some woman says, who's the really bad king? Richard III, maybe? It's like, shall I be tempted by the devil? And he says, I, if the devil tempt thee to do good. Anyway, that kept me up at night. Um, <laughs> so, uh, O oh Lord, because you have led me astray, aghwetani, this is the devil speaking, right? Aghwetani, um, I will surely lead all of them astray. Right? So God will lead, uh, sorry, the devil will lead them astray, just as God led the devil astray. Now, how did they all lead the devil astray? Should we believe the devil? Those are interesting questions. But at least the word is used for both of them. Um, and, and another word that's used for both God and Satan is Zayyina. Um, so the devil makes, the devil and God seem to cooperate in this work of Zayyina or Tezyin in Arabic. Right, so we have one verse where it says, um, Satan, one of the tricks that Satan has is he makes bad things seem good to you. Right, it's his temptation. He makes bad things seem good to you. But God does exactly the same thing in this third quotation, right? We have made their deeds seem decorous to them, and so they are bewildered. Again, it's the unbelievers. Does that make sense? Questions or comments about this? Now, what's, what's the difference? They're not, I'm not saying God and the devil are the same. That would be pretty bad theology. That would be like the worst theology ever, right? So I'm not actually saying that. The difference is, God does this to unbelievers, and Satan does this to believers. Satan seeks to tempt believers and ruin believers, and God seeks to keep unbelievers from believing. He doesn't just withhold his forgiveness, he actively <coughs> opposes them. I mean, here's just a general point, that I probably should have said this at the very beginning, but I didn't, right? That sometimes people may have the notion, maybe, well, it could be Muslim or non-Muslim, People have the notion that well, the Quran and Islam is just like generic God, right? Because it's not like Christianity where you have this notion of Trinity and incarnation and all these things, right? It's just God monotheistic, so it's like generic God. There's no such thing as generic God. God is known through the scripture in every word, every line of the scripture defines God in a special way. 
right? So go, even if we're saying, if, even if you would hold that Muslims and Christians and Jews, maybe others like Sikhs, worship the same God, but their understanding of God is marked by every single word that their scripture says about God, right? So this is a distinctive God, the God of the Quran. And this is one of uh, the features of the God, is this, of this God, is the opposition to the unbelievers. Um, even in one place, the Quran seems to suggest that God mocks unbelievers. Um, again, this is one of those points where theologically, not all Muslims are okay with this notion. Yastahzi'u is the Arabic word. And so I've just put up some here, some different translations. You know, Pickthal says, doth mock them. Um, Yusuf Ali says, throw back their mockery. Um, Asad, who is very um, rationalist in his interpretation, Asad says, God will requite them for their mockery. So we have some different notions. Like, can God actually mock? But if you look in the Bible, God also mocks unbelievers in the Bible, or at least um, the enemies of God. Um, in, in Psalm 2, he who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. Yahweh makes a mockery of them. So we have something like that there. And we're just going to keep moving along. There's just really two more points. One is, um, this is following up on an observation already made about God sealing hearts. This is a very common phrase in the Quran that God seals hearts. Usually the verb is tabaha, taba, um, which means to seal or to close. Um, already we have this in Quran chapter, um, uh, chapter 2, almost the very beginning of the text. God seals both hearts and hearing. This relation, this is actually probably related to the notion of uncircumcised hearts, um, which actually appears in the Quran in two different passages, 288 and I believe um, um, 4155, that um, the Israelites are said to have uncircumcised hearts, and there's a sense of covered hearts, uncircumcision in the sense of covering, right? Now, I just... Again, not everyone likes, depends on your theological orientation. Are you okay with the sealing, this notion of sealed hearts, God's sealing hearts, keeping unbelievers from repenting and believing? Right, because if you're sort of a rationalist who thinks through God and understands God as merciful, like why would God actually keep an unbeliever from believing? Why would he do that? And someone like Zamakhshari, who dies in 1144 and is a Mu'tazali, so a rationalist interpreter of the text, he says this cannot, it can, sealing cannot be sealing, right? So he says there are other ways to understand it. Maybe the text says sealing as just an innate disposition of unbelief. Maybe it's used figuratively, so it doesn't mean sealing at all. And he gives some examples of figurative expressions. I like this. The condor bird has flown away with someone when a person is absent, right? It doesn't mean the bird actually picked the person up. Um, or maybe it's actually Satan and unbelievers who do the, the sealing, but the power is attributed to God because all power ultimately comes from God. So the power comes from God, but the act is the act of Satan or the unbelievers. Okay, well, I promised I'd say something about divine trickery in the Bible, and um, you know we have two interesting examples of this. Um, one of this is in the Old Testament where um, God actually wants this evil, unbelieving king, Ahab, who doesn't appear in the Quran. He's from the northern, the northern tribes, the north of Israel, um, before um, the northern tribes are taken off into exile by the Assyrians. Um, so Ahab's this like bad dude, right? And God is like, I don't want, uh, I want Ahab to go down. And so um, he sort of has his court of angels around him. Um, and he says, who will um, entice Ahab into going to his death, you know, um, by giving him a false prophecy. And so um, this spirit says, I will go and be a deceptive spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And so that's sort of a plot. And Ahab, you know, bites the dust. Is that how you say it? And then, um, even in the New Testament, now, it's not explicit in the New Testament, so I don't want to overstate this point. But in interpretation of the New Testament, um, there is this notion um, that um, God sort of tricked the devil into thinking that he could possess Christ. Right, so this quotation from, um, from Origen, um, who says, 
Um, who did God give his life, or who did Christ give his life as a ransom? Not to God, um, but could it be to the evil one, for the evil one's holding fast until the ransom should be given to him, being deceived with the idea that he could have dominion over it. So when Christ rose from the dead, that's when the plot or the scheme was accomplished. You know, the evil one thought he could have the life of Christ and give up the life of others and possess Christ, according to this way of thinking through the crucifixion. Um, and he didn't realize that Christ had power over death and would rise from the dead. This sort of, I mean, you use a fancy word, soteriological image, notion of salvation, is expressed in a couple of um, recent films, one based on a book, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, where um, if you know the story, um, the, the witch who represents um, the devil um, agrees to a deal in which she takes the life of, um, of the lion, Aslan, instead of the life of the, tr the one who betrayed, um, uh, betrayed him, and, um, of course, the lion raises, r rises from the dead, and um, she ends up with nothing, and she's not happy about it. Um, and so this table, which represents the deal, is broken. So it sort of represents a sort of trickery. And then in The Passion of the Christ, we have this last scene of the devil um, being um, in anger, in wrath, because Christ has risen from the dead, and the devil thought that he... Actually, it's a female actor, so maybe she uh, was able to possess Christ and would hold on to hold on to him in um, in hell after his death. But Christ rises from the dead. Okay, so that's notion is there. Just one final slide. I think this is it. Um, it's just to sort of close everything on a positive note with something that we alluded to, which is that um, you know connected to istidraj is this idea then that. Um, there's a sort of um, implication for a positive theodicy, namely that when God gives you suffering or deprivation, that it's for your good, that it's actually a sort of grace. Um, um, and even the threat of hell, so all of this stuff about punishment, maybe even the threats of divine vengeance and trickery, which are meant to scare you into belief, so that you won't be in the unbelieving camp, Right? Maybe all of this is meant for your good. I mean, that's the notion, at least, of this Matazali theologian known as Abdul Jabbar, who says, as for the threat of hell, it is a favor or grace, Lutf. Um, and because uh, by repeating it in the Book of God, um, um, and it's a sort of exhortation um, by way of re reproaching humans who read it. This is a favor and a goodness. Okay, questions or comments? Okay, excellent. So, um, Notre Dame students, I'll see you on Thursday. Notre Dame students and MOOC students will be all together on Friday. We'll see you then. Thank you.